Unferth spoke, Egclaf's son, who sat at Hrothgar's feet, spoke harshly and sharp, vexed by Beowulf's adventure, by their visitors' courage and angry that anyone in Denmark or anywhere on earth had ever acquired glory and fame greater than his own. You're Beowulf, are you? The same boastful fool who fought a swimming match with Breca? Both of you daring and young and proud, exploring the deepest seas, risking your lives for no reason but the danger? All older and wiser heads warned you not to, but no one could check such pride. With Breca at your side, you swam along the sea's path, your swift, swift moving hands pulling you over the ocean's face. Then winter churned through the water and waves ran you as they willed and you struggled seven long nights to survive. And at the end, victory was his, not yours. The sea carried him close to his home, to southern Norway, near the land of Brandings, where he ruled and was loved, where his treasure was piled, his strength protected, his town and his people. He promised to outswim you. But Bronston's son made the boastful boast ring true. You've been lucky in your battles, Beowulf, but I think your luck may change if you challenge Grendel. Saying a whole night through in this hall, waiting where the fiercest of demons can find you. Beowulf answered at Getho's great son, Ah, Unferth, my friend, your face is hot with ale and your tongue has tried to tell us about Breca's doings. But the truth is simple. No man swims in the sea as I can. No strength is a match for mine. As boys, Breca and I had boasted, we were both too young to know better, that we'd risk our lives for out at sea as so we did. Each of us carried a naked sword prepared for whales or swift sharp teeth and beaks of needlefish. He could never leave me behind, swim faster across the waves than I could, and I had chosen to remain close to his side. I remained near him for five long nights until a flood swept us apart. The frozen sea surged around me. It grew dark with the wind, turned bitter, blowing from the north, and the waves were savage creatures who slept in the sea were stirred into life. And the iron-hammered links of my mail shirt, these shining beasts of metal woven across my breast, saved me from death. A monster seized me, drew swiftly towards the bottom, swimming with its claws tight in my flesh. But fate let me find its heart with my sword. Hack myself free. I fought that beast's last battle, left it floating lifeless in the sea. Other monsters crowded around me, continually attacking. I treated them politely, offering the edge of my razor-sharp sword. But the feast, I think, did not please them filled their evil bellies with no banquet rich food thrashing at the bottom of the sea by morning they decided to sleep on the shore lying on their blacks their blood spilled onto the sand afterwards sailors could cross the sea road and feel no fear nothing would stop their passing then god's bright beacon appeared in the east the water lay still and at last i could see the land wind swept cliffs walls at the edge of the coast Fate saves the living when they drive away death by themselves. Lucky or not, nine was the number of sea huge monsters I killed. What man anywhere under heaven's high arch has fought in such darkness, endured more misery, or been harder pressed? Yet I survived the sea, smashed the monster's hot jaws, swam home from my journey. The swift flowing water swept me along, and I landed on finished soil. I've heard no tales of you, Unferth, telling of such clashing cares, such contests in the night. Breca's battles were never so bold. Neither he nor you can match me, and I mean no boast, have announced no more than I know to be true. And there's more. You murdered your brothers, your own close kin. Words and bright wit won't help your soul. You'll suffer hell's fires, Unferth, forever tormented. Headclaff's proud son, if your hands were as hard as your heart, as fierce as you think it, no fool would dare to raid your hall, ruin Herod, and oppress its prince, as Grendel has done. But he's learned that terror is his alone. 
discovered he can come for your people with no fear of reprisal. He's found no fighting here, but only food, only delight. He murders as he likes with no mercy, gorges and feasts on your flesh, and expects no trouble, no quarrel from the quiet Danes. Now the Geats will show him courage. Soon he can test his strength in battle, and when the sun comes up again, opening another bright day from the south, anyone in Denmark may enter this hall that evil will be gone. Rothgar, gray-haired and brave, sat happily, listening to the famous ring giver, sure, at last, that Grendel could be killed. He believed in Beowulf's bold strength and the firmness of his spirit. There was the sound of laughter and the cheerful clanking of cups and pleasant words. Then, Welthau, Hrothgar's gold-ringed queen, and greeted the warriors, a noble woman who knew what was right. She raised a flowing cup to Hrothgar first, holding it high for the lord of the Danes to drink, wishing him joy in the feast. The famous king drank with pleasure and blessed their banquet. Then, Welthau went from the warrior to warrior, pouring a portion from the jeweled cup for each till the bracelet-wearing queen had carried the mead cup among them, and it was Beowulf's turn to be served. She saluted the Geats, greeted print, great prince, thanked God for answering her prayers, for allowing her hands in happy duty, off offering mead to a hero who had helped her afflicted people. He drank what she poured. At Detho's brave son then assured the Danish queen that his heart was firm and his hands ready. When we crossed the sea, my comrades and I, I already knew that all my purpose was this, to win the goodwill of your people or die in battle, pressed in Grendel's first fierce grip. Let me live in greatness and courage or there in this hall welcome my death. Welthau was pleased with his words, his bright tongue boast. She carried them back to her lord, walked nobly across his side. The feast went on laughter and music and the brave words of warriors celebrating their delight. Then Rothgar rose, health Dane's son, heavy with sleep. As soon as the sun had gone, he knew that Grendel would come to Herod, would visit that hall when the night had covered the earth with its net and the shape of darkness moved black and silent through the world. Rothgar's warriors rose with him. He went to Beowulf, embraced the Geats' brave prince, wished him well, and hoped that Herod would be his to command. And then he declared, No one strange to this land has ever been granted what I've given you. No one in all the years of my rule. Make this best of all mead halls yours, and then keep it free of evil. Fight with the glory in your heart. Purge, Herod, your ship will sail home with its treasure holds full. Then Reth Rothgar that left that hall, the Dane's great protector, followed by his court. The queen had preceded him, and he went to lie at her side, seek sleep near his wife. It was said that God himself had sent a sentinel in Herod, brought Beowulf as a guard against Grendel and a shield behind whom the king could safely rest. And Beowulf was ready, firm with our Lord's high favor in his own bold courage and strength. He stripped off his mail shirt, his helmet, his sword, hammered from the hardest iron and handed all his weapons and armor to his servant, ordered his war gear guarded till morning, and then, standing beside his bed, he exclaimed, Grendel is no braver, no stronger than I am. I could kill him with my sword. I shall not, easy as it would be. This fiend is a bold and famous fighter, but his claws and teeth scratching at my shield, his clumsy fist beating at my sword blade would be helpless. I will meet him with my hands empty, unless his heart fails him, seeing a soldier waiting weaponless, unafraid. Let God in his wisdom extend his hand where he wills, reward whom he chooses. Then the Geats, great chief, dropped his head to his pillow, and around him, as ready to, they could be, lay the soldiers who had crossed the sea at his side, each of them sure that he was lost, to the home he loved, to the high-walled towns, and the friends he had left behind, where both he and they had been raised. Each thought of the Danes murdered by Grendel in the hall, where Geats and Danes, and not Danes, now slept. But God's dread loom 
was woven with defeat for the monster's good fortune, for the Geats, help against Grendel was with them. And though and through the might of a single man, they would win. Who doubts that God in his wisdom and strength holds the earth forever in his hands? Out in the darkness, the monster began to walk. The warriors slept in the gabled hall where they hoped that he would keep them safe from evil, guard them from death till the end of their days was determined and the thread should be broken. But Beowulf lay wakeful, watching, waiting eager to meet his enemy and angry at the thought of his coming. Out from the marsh, from the foot of the misty hills and bogs, bearing God's hatred, Grendel came, hoping to kill. Anyone he could trap on his trip to High Harris, he moved quickly through the cloudy night up from his swampland, sliding silently towards the gold-shining hall. He had visited Rothgar's home before, knew the way, but never before nor after that night found Herrick defended so firmly, his reception so harsh. He journeyed, forever joyless, straight to the door, then snapped it open, tore its iron fasteners with a touch, and rushed angrily over the threshold. He strode quickly across the inlay floor, snarling and fierce. His eyes gleamed in the darkness, burned with gruesome light. Then he stopped, seeing the hall crowded with sleeping warriors, stuffed with rows of young soldiers resting together, and his heart laughed. He relished the sight, intended to tear their life from those bodies by morning. The monster's mind was hot with the thought of food, and feasting his belly would soon know. But fate that night intended Grendel to gnaw the broken bones of his last human supper. Human eyes were watching his evil steps, waiting to see his swift, hard claws. Grendel snatched at the first gate he came to, ripped him apart, cut his body to bits with powerful jaws, drank the blood from his veins, and bolted him down, hands and feet. Death and Grendel's great teeth came together, snapping life shut. Then he stepped to another, still body, clutched at Beowulf with his claws, grasped at a strong-hearted, wakeful sleeper, and was instantaneously seized himself. Claws bent back as Beowulf leaned up on one arm. That, that shepherd of evil, guardian of crime, knew at once that nowhere on earth had he met a man whose hands were harder. His mind was flooded with fear, but nothing could shake, take his talons and himself from that tight, hard grip. Grendel's one thought was to turn from Beowulf, flee back to his marsh, and hide there. This was a different Herod than the hall he had emptied. But Higlax's followers remembered his final boast, and standing erect, stopped the monster's flight, fastened those claws in, in his fists till they cracked, clutched Grendel's closer. The infamous killer fought for his freedom, wanted no flesh but retreat, desiring nothing but escape. His claws had been caught in he was trapped. That trip to Herod was a miserable journey for the writhing monster. A high hall rang its roof, boards swayed, and the Danes shook with terror. Down the aisles in battle swept, angry and wild, Herod trembled. Wonderfully built to withstand the blows, the struggling great bodies beating at its beautiful walls, shaped and fastened with iron inside and out, artfully worked, the building stern stood firm. Its benches rattled, fell to the floor, gold-covered boards grating as Grendel and Beowulf battled across them. Rothgar's wide men, wise men had fashioned Herod to stand forever. Only fire, they had planned, could shatter what such skill had put together. Swallow in hot flames such splendor of ivory and iron and wood. Suddenly, the sound changed. The Danes started in new terror, cowering in their beds at the terrible screams of almighty enemies saying in the darkness the horrible shrieks of pain and defeat the tears from torn out of grendel's taut throat hell's captive caught in the arms of him who of all men on earth was the strongest that almighty protector of men meant to hold the monster till its life leaped out knowing the fiend was no use to anyone in denmark all of Beowulf's band had jumped from their beds, ancestral sores raised and ready, determined to protect their prince if they could. Their courage was great, but all wasted. They could hack at Grendel from every side, trying to open a path for his evil soul, but their points could not hurt him. The sharpest and hardest iron could not scratch at his skin. 
before, that sin-stained demon had bewitched all men's weapons, laid spells that blunted every mortal man's blades, and yet his time had come. His days were over, his death near. Down to hell he would go, swept, groaning and helpless, to the waiting hands and still worse fiends. Now he discovered, once the afflictor of men, tormentor of their days, what it meant to feud with Almighty God. Grendel saw that this his strength was deserting him, his claws bound fast, Higlack's brave follower tearing at his hands. The monster's hatred rose higher, but his power had gone. He twisted in pain, and the bleeding sinews deep in his shoulders snapped. Muscle and bone split and broke. The battle was over. Beowulf had been granted new glory. Grendel escaped, but wounded as he was, he could flee to his den, his miserable hole at the bottom of the marsh, only to die to wait for the end of all his days. And after that bloody combat, the Danes laughed with delight. He, who had come to them from across the sea, bold and strong-minded, had driven affliction off, purged Herod clean. He was happy now with the might knight's fierce work. The Danes had been served as he'd boasted he'd served them. Beowulf, a prince of the Geats, had killed Grendel, ended the grief of the sorrow, the suffering, forced on Hrothgar's Hearth, helpless people by bloodthirsty fiend. No Dane doubted the victory for the proof hanging high from the rafters where Beowulf had hung it was the monster's arm, claw and shoulder and all.